Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, our heart is full of thanksgiving for your goodness and kindness. Once again, we are gathered in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be thought your word. I'm asking you to speak to every heart in this place in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, thank you because you are good and kind. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. All the women remain standing. I want to pray for all the women. All the men can sit. Lord, we pray for all the women here. Thank you for this special month and day to celebrate them. My prayer is for you is this, that whatever brings you joy will not be taken. I pray in the day of your celebration, you will not be represented. When others are celebrated, you will not be packed aside. On your journey in life, experience grace and support. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray for the single mothers, your case will not end up in tears. The Lord will raise you up from every corner and side. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. God bless you, you can have your seat. Praise the Lord. All the men stand up, let's go ahead and appreciate the women. All the men stand up, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead. Put it together. Is there's a lady next to you? Shake them and let's know that we appreciate you, ma'am. We appreciate you. We appreciate you, ma'am. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. It's nice to see everyone in church this morning. We're going to appreciate some women. We have gifts, right? We have gifts. We have, please, let's come, let's come, let's come. We have gifts. We are them. mothers, women. Miss Safalabi, come quickly, come quickly. Have you gotten a scarf already? You didn't get a scarf? Ooh. Thank you. So, different, different gifts. Yep, yeah, can I have where's the where's the oldest in the third service we appreciated our oldest church member that was a woman. Our oldest church member is a woman and uh, she's hundred years old. Yeah. And of course there are about five generations she's there. Our daughter is a great grandmother and you know, she's, you know it's it's a big you know, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So firstly I want to welcome so I'm just going to speak. Who is the oldest? If you're above 60 in this service, ends up. You're a woman above 60 in this service. Above 60, yes. Okay, I found one. Above, I found another. Above 65. Ends up above 65. Have you found somebody? The, the two of them are above 60. Okay, above 62. Above 62, yes. So... Yes, please come. Ma. Oh, what am I calling that? I, I need to find I need to choose. Okay, well, I have all this gift. Can I have the gift board? Yeah. Is that one of the gifts also? Yeah, yeah. Pastor Jerry, where's Pastor Jerry? Please come. Above 62. 62. It's okay. It's okay. Please come. They will help you. They will help. Above 62, 62. Are you above 62, ma? Okay, oh, but I was trying to choose one. Now the three of you came. So I don't know if I have enough gift for the three of you, you know. So we're going to give happy Mother's Day to you, ma. Yeah. Oh, wow. Praise God. Please come close, ma. She's just having a moment of worship, and I want us to respect it. Yeah. 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 We have. I can do this. Praise God. What do you want me to do? Give this out or give this out? Give this out. Okay, so they said I should not give you this one. They wanted something bigger. This is a spa shopping voucher for you. God bless you. God bless you. Yes, I need one more. I need one more now. Oh, I thought I should give, I should give this one out also. Okay, please, ma. Yes, I'm giving this over to you also. God bless you. Please, please. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
Hallelujah. So, Mrs. Falaga, I'm not sure I'll give you one of those calves. Yeah, I know that you are very fashionistic. You can see that's on you. Congratulations. Congratulations. I'm, I'm meant to wait for you. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Falabi, can I have your permission to wait for your wife? All right, that's good. Just to make sure I'm not trespassing. So I guess that the remaining scarves are going to be on their way right now. Yeah. 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 If only you knew. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not gonna tie to her. Your husband can lose it anytime he wants. Thank you, Pastor. Oh wow! How does she look now? Happy Mother's Day. Well, I'm partial with this flower. I'm partial with this. So I stepped into church and saw my, my cousin that is a mom, you know, in the person of Oyinda. Oyinda, will you come? That's my cousin. She has two lovely kids. She didn't think I would call her out at all, but... Uh, yeah. Thank you. Let's take a picture and send everybody in our family. <laughs> yeah. I'm a nice cousin. <laughs> Praise God. There's one more flower. Really? And there's no more gift. I have a wonderful treasure. The gifts of God without treasure. What, what would I give it to? Here. I'm sorry I couldn't show that much. <laughs> Praise God. After the service, there's Indomine for all the women outside. So just take packs of Indomine. Do we still have it or is finished? There's Indomine for all the women. Sister Lelo, look at you over there. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. There's there's, you know, there's, um, yeah, praise God. I will have asked um, Spyro to sing, you are the only fine girl, but I don't want to trend again on social media. <laughs> I think I've, me and Spyro have traded enough for like 10 years. We'll continue in the next decade, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Come again to the word of God today. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. So in this service, let's turn our Bible quickly to Philippians chapter 4. I'm dealing with a series, overcoming negative thoughts. Overcoming what? Negative thoughts. Overcoming negative thoughts. Key principle, whatever you think you draw. Key principle, whatever you think you draw. Whatever you're thinking consistently, you begin to draw to yourself. It's so powerful that... Do you know that this principle is so powerful that sometimes you are thinking about somebody else and the person calls you on the phone? And the reason why is that there's a connection. I, I read it somewhere. There's a connection. Whatever you're thinking, you draw. The way the Bible says it this way is this. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So let's go ahead into God's word. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. Let's see what God's word tells us. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 we have about three scriptures to read the bible says finally brethren what things soever are true what things soever are honest what things soever are just what things soever are pure what things soever are lovely what things soever are good report if there be any virtue or any praise think on these things i love the way apostle paul says it you can give me the passion translation how apostle paul begins to tell us what to think about he says whenever you want to think about something Make sure that, see, see, see what it says here in the Passion Translation. 
So keep your thoughts continually fixed. It tells you something. This is something I did not know before. It took me time to realize this, that I can control what I put my thoughts on. It took me a long time to realize this. I thought that I was a victim of my thoughts. But now I know that, you know, I can control what I put my thoughts on. And you know, what you put your thoughts on will determine how you feel. I hope you know that. So for example, it's Mother's Day and it's Mother's Day and I woke up my phone and I saw people posting their mom and sharing memory memory pictures and my mind went back to my mom. And it was very painful because, you know, my mom was a very hardworking woman. She did a lot for her family. And um, as soon as we were getting older, that was when my mom passed on. And it was most painful because if I did not have a revelation that my mother would pass on, that would be different. Twice in a dream, I saw my mom dying. And I kept on praying. And for the third time, you know, my sister also had a dream. And, you know, of something very similar. I, my was very direct. In my dream, I was told that my mother died. And I do not dream. So I began to really, really pray. But eventually, my mom died. My mom died one week to my sister's wedding. Very heartbreaking. One week to my sister's wedding. And, you know, I remember I was called. I went to her house. And she was lying on the bed. And whenever you express loss... One of the first things that happens to you is denial. You can't believe it. You're thinking that someone is going to wake you up from it. You're going to think that, no way, someone is going to wake you up from this. As a matter of fact, this will be about the 13th year my mother has died. Should I shock you? I still have her phone number. You know, right where I keep my passport, my mom's passport is there. You know, right where I keep my, my mom's passport is there. But one of the things I've learned, one of the things I've learned about how to deal with grief and if you're dealing with grief, this will help you a lot. Is that number one? When there is grief, there'll be many questions. But the truth is this where there are many questions, you must realize that not all questions will find answer on this side of eternity. And that's very powerful. The Bible says that the things are revealed are revealed. He says the things are revealed are revealed. Not all questions will find answers. On this side of eternity. You could ask, you, sometimes you're asking yourself, this person was too good to die. This person was too young to die. Why should it be my brother? Why should it be my mother? Why should it be my cousin? Why should it be this person? And there'll be many questions. But the truth is that on this side of eternity, we may never find the answers to all questions. And the second thing about grief is this. When Paul went through a tough time, we learned something powerful. It says this. It says, my grace is sufficient for you and my strength is made perfect in your weakness. One of the things loss and grief does to you is this. If you can relate with it very well, it will bring a strength out of you that you did not know was there before. And that's why all of you that have lost someone, when you look back after one or two years, you are surprised how strong you could have been you have surprised how strong you carry. When they were alive, you never thought you could be that strong. And the third thing that happened is, he said, he said, he said, he said, my grace is sufficient and my strength is made perfect in your weakness. What will happen is this, there are some new dimensions of you that will emerge just because of that transition. And lastly, this is what helps me the most. Every time my mind is asking myself a question like, ah, how can this person die? How can this person die? How can this die? Especially people that you don't expect to die. Maybe you're thinking that this is a powerful man of God. There's something I told myself I learned. And what is it? I don't allow what I don't understand to confuse what I understand. Did you get that? There are things I do not understand. So what I do in this season is that I don't allow what I do not understand to confuse what I understand. Let me give you how this works in medicine. In medical science, when someone has typhoid, there's a procedure. They will give you certain drugs used for certain days. If it's intense, you have certain drips and you recover. That's as simple as that. Very powerful. But guess what? There are people they've administered those drugs to that eventually died. Yes or no? Do the doctors stop saying that way of treatment is fake? Did they say so? Do they cancel it? What the doctor says is that this is an isolated case. So what they are eventually saying is that 
We don't understand why this happened, but we understand that this works. And we don't allow what we don't understand to confuse what we understand. The reason why I'm saying so is that if you're not careful, your life can go into a limbo or coma. Your belief can enter chaos if you allow what you do not understand to begin to interfere with what you understand. It will just tumble everything out. So when something happens, I prayed about something. It didn't go the way I prayed about. I prayed about something. Someone died. I don't say God is not faithful. What I say to myself is that something I understand is that God is faithful. Something I know is that God is kind. What I know is that God has answered prayer. I've seen too many examples of this in my life. Why these two, three, four, five incidences happen, I do not understand. But I'm not going to allow these four incidences to destroy what I understand about the faithfulness of God, about the goodness of God, about the greatness of God. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. That's a great time to clap. Somebody say hallelujah. So in back to Philippians chapter 4 verse 8, he says, so keep your thought fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable, admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind, and fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising him. Why is it important? Why is it, why is it important for us to cancel or limit negative thought? Number one, negative thoughts will limit and weigh you down in life. Negative thoughts will make you feel powerless. Negative thoughts has the capacity to make you feel powerless. If you have ever felt powerless about pursuing your dreams, then you have to listen to this. And some of you, you not just felt powerless, you just feel as if great things can never happen through your life because you're imperfect. Because every time you have a dream of doing something great in business, of doing something great in life, if you have a big dream, then your imperfections are popping up. Oh, you're not handsome enough. You don't have enough money. You don't have the right background. Oh, God cannot bless you because of this. God cannot bless you because of that. Let me tell you something that will help you quickly. Imperfection has never been a reason God did not bless people. I want it to soak in imperfection has never stopped God's blessings. Because some of you are here, the devil says, oh, the reason why you can't have a child is because of this. The reason why you can't get married because of this. And you feel very humiliated. You feel literally powerless. Because there's this thought that makes you feel that the reason why you're stuck is you. That you are the problem of your life. And what can you do? You can't change yourself. He says the reason why you can't go forward is because, you know, you don't have this. You don't have that. You can't do this. You can't do that. When those thoughts come to you, tell yourself ultimately, tell yourself all the time rather, that imperfection has never stopped God from blessing people. Someone say, prove it. I want to prove it to you. God used a man called David. David but was both a mother and an adulterer. God used a man called Jacob. Jacob was both a cheat and a liar. God used a man called Moses. Moses had a huge temper. God used another man called Joseph. He was such a talkative. God used another woman called Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute. God used Jeremiah. Jeremiah was what they call it, was a stammerer. If God can use all these people with their imperfection, that is proof that God will use you in spite of your imperfection imperfection has never stopped god's blessing the reason why is that in god's nature god oh my god oh glory to god oh god glory to god glory to god glory to god can we go deeper here can we go deeper here there's no one like my god i tell you the truth and the reason is simple the reason is this very powerful because this is the reason why this is powerful because when human beings want to get a job done human beings look for who is most qualified is that just to know when god wants to get a job done god looks for who is least qualified or else how can you explain you want someone to go and negotiate a deal with egypt you send someone that is a stammerer the samurai says, my brother can talk. If I were God, I would say, let's move to the brother. God says, hey, if we move to the smooth talker, the smooth talker would did, he did it himself. So God says, let's stick with the samurai so that in his wilded imagination, he can never think that this was his work. God was going to look for someone to deliver Israel from the hands of the media. You know what he looked for? He looked for a scary rat called Jephthah. Jeff, 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 this we look for someone that was scared. 
God wanted to feed 5,000 people. He didn't look for the richest man like Joseph of Ramatia. He looked for a boy with five loaves and two fishes. Why does God use insignificant things to do big things? To let you know that he is God that qualifies the call and not, oh my God. He qualifies the call and not the other way around. And some of you are here today. You just feel imperfect. I've had an abortion. Things have gone wrong with this. Things have gone wrong with that. Things have gone wrong with this. Things have gone wrong with that. Hey! It's time to get over yourself. Imperfection has never been the reason that God has stopped his blessings. Glory to God. I said glory to God. I said glory to God. How do you overcome? So, so, so the Bible tells us what to do. So how do I overcome? So question, how do I overcome? Can, can I get a bottle of water? That bottle on the chair? Yeah. Can I get another bottle of water? How do I overcome negative thoughts? I'll tell you how to overcome negative thoughts now. Is it opened? How do I overcome negative thoughts? By filling my mind with good thoughts. Every time your mind is not filled with good thoughts, there's an empty space that negative thoughts can come in. Why is it going in? Because it's not filled. As soon as it's filled, it will be difficult for negative thoughts to sink in. If your mind is empty, it will be housed to negative thoughts. The question is that, is your mind empty? So many of you are saying, I don't want negative thoughts, but your mind is empty. So what happens? Negative thoughts will keep coming from time to time. Why not make a conscious decision? Why not make a conscious decision today and say, from this hour, I will start filling my mind with good thoughts. You know what you do with good thoughts? By, you know, let me tell you something I do. And I, I've told our pastors, one of the things I do early in the morning is that I just stand up and I begin to think of what I'm grateful for. The reason why is that if I don't consciously program myself to think of what I'm grateful for, my mind will drag me into what I'm bitter about. Someone says, how do you know? Every time we don't plant things on the earth, it's weed that grows on the earth. My body is weed. If I don't plant things consciously, weed will spring for it. So in the morning, I toil my ground and plant things. So I'm like, what am I grateful for today? So I look back and I say, oh, this happened yesterday. This happened yesterday. This happened yesterday. Lord, I am grateful. What am I doing? I'm consciously cultivating my heart with good thoughts. Glory to God. I said glory to God. So this morning I woke up and when I woke up I had all this thoughts about oh people's mothers and all of that. I thought, oh my own mother is nowhere to be found. I didn't have a good picture of my mom again. Mom again. I'm like, you know, I'm like thinking of those things and I said, and, and, my, and my mind said, oh wow, look at how sad it should be. And I said, oh, if my mother can see from heaven, she'll be so proud. That's a good thought. That's a good thought. That's a good thought. That's a good thought. The question is that, do you dwell on good or bad thoughts? And the thing is that, it's natural for bad thoughts to come out of you. Why not develop a routine where you continually put good thoughts in your heart? What's a good thought? I'm beautiful. The reason why is that if you don't say you're beautiful, the day one guy says to you, you are ugly, it will get to you because you've never told yourself that. But when your glass is full already and someone says you're ugly, it will only overflow because there's no space for that kind of thought to stay inside you. The day someone says you're a failure, you're like, um, you know, there's a way you bounce it. Oh my God. You know, have you ever given someone feedback before? Let me give you this. We do this more with compliments. Hey, you're, you're very good at what you do. No, 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 no. And they just bounce it off you. The same thing. You know why they bounce it off you? Because their mind is full of a perception that they already have that is contrary to what you are saying. So the same thing here. If someone says you're a failure, but in your mind you're full of perception that I'm beautifully and wonderfully made. Christ in me is the hope of glory. When you say you're a failure, you will just in a way reflect that back and bounce it back to them. The reason why is that you put a lot of things within you already. So he says this. So this is what the, this verse is advising us. He says, one of the ways to keep out negative thoughts 
is to wake up early and fill your mind. You have to do it for yourself. You feel, let's go back to King James. So, we can read this and go back to King James. Say, so keep your thoughts continually fixed. You didn't want to say, he said, keep it there. Continually fixed there. Come, come, you come. He said, keep it there. You know, let me show you what keep it there means. You, you know, this guy's wearing a tie. After walking from time to time, his tie can go like this. He looks into the mirror and puts it back to the same place. And the tie he looks him, put it back in the same place. Why? He's trying to fix the tie back to position. Your thought can keep on dangling here or there. It's your job to say, hey, thought, stay here. Oh, hey, thought, stay here. Your thought can be like, nobody will pay for me. Nobody will do business with me. I will fail in business. You hold your thought and say, stay here, stay here. And you tie, you tie it like a tie. You tie your thought. You tie it like a tie. And after some more activity, it moves again. You tie there every morning. And this is why you come to church every week. Because every week you come to church, I'm tying your thoughts thought for you. I'm putting it in this place. On Wednesday, I'm tying your thoughts for you. Next level prayer, we're tying your thoughts for you. When you read the Bible, you're tying your thoughts for you. The point is that when you stay away from this thing so far, what happens to your thought? It becomes this bad. You know, we, it becomes this bad. We don't even know if it's a thought again. This doesn't even look like a tie again. We don't, we don't even know what's doing again. It looks worn out. It looks tired. It looks exhausted. And that's why some of you are worn out or exhausted. The reason why is that your thoughts have not been tied. And guess what? It's easier to fix your tie when it's somewhere here than when it's here. And when it's totally down like this. And that's how some people's tire. You have to start the job afresh again. And someone says, ah, how come my picture is not just simple like this? Because it's, we have to start again. Because you've allowed your thoughts to carry you away. And if you don't tie your thoughts, then your thoughts begin to pull you. Since you can't control your tie, your tie will control you. It will pull you. Then you wake up, like some of you, you will just enter a mood. I don't know how to enter a mood. And if I'm angry, I can flip my mood. Because I'm the one that is angry. The anger is not having me. Am I not longer angry? Okay, I'm no longer angry. Because what you, be, what you do is that you behave as if your emotion has that control over you. No, sir. Your emotion does not have the control over you. If it has control, it's because subconsciously you've released control to your emotion. Now you can take charge of your emotions and keep going. Praise God. So I says, I woke up, I don't feel like doing this again. I don't feel like doing a lot of things in my life, including what I'm doing right now. I do it. I'm telling you, sometimes when I wake up, it's a problem for when I wake up because I wake up very early. My body goes, let's sleep. You know what I just do? I count three to five. One, two, three. I just say, yeah! Like that, yeah! I just jump. The reason why is that my body will follow my action. Stop waiting to feel like let your body follow your action. Praise God. I said praise God. I said praise God. When this economic crisis started, I mapped it out. We as a church were going to give 100 million worth of food out. I was like, where will we get the money from? We're trying to build. We're trying to do this. I don't even know if people will keep giving because things are so tight right now. Have you seen the videos of the containers of food? We have, received, we have done the first 50 million now in food. Show us the pictures. Show us the pictures. And we did not raise one cobble. Show us the picture. Do you have it at the back? Look at that. These are when the containers are, the, the chillers bringing, we're loading the food into containers. Rice, gari, beans, we're loading the food into containers. See how long the, con the containers, all that place is different kind of containers there. You see the container? That's me right there. You didn't notice that part. That's a good time to clap. Because it was carry time. But the question is this. Did I feel we could do it? It's not about feeling. My feeling will follow my action. So what do I do? I set my thoughts. I set my thoughts. Right now, 
this is happening financially, this is happening in marriage, correct your thoughts. Correct your thoughts. Every morning, reset your thoughts. Let me tell you why your thoughts must be clean. Matthew chapter 5 verse 8. I'm going to show you the same scripture. I'm bold, I want you to watch this. I want to show you the same scripture. Matthew chapter 5 verse 8. In a different light. Correct your thoughts. Stop having bad thoughts about your husband. Stop having bad thoughts about your marriage. Stop having bad thoughts about people. <clears throat> Want to go? Let's read. Want to go? Traditionally, we have said pure in the heart means no sin. But I want to take it as the word is. Blessed are those that are pure in their thinking, for they shall see God. If your thinking is pure, you will be blessed. Why have I not been blessed? My thinking has not been pure. Why have I not seen the hand of God in this situation? My thinking has not been pure. I've allowed negative thoughts to fill my mind. That's why I have not been blessed. That's why I've not seen the hand of God. It's the blessed are those that are pure in heart. And heart sometimes will mean your thinking. It's a blessed are those that are pure in heart. That means that I maintain a purity within my heart that allows me to see the hand of God. So when people are saying that men are difficult, mm -mm. men cannot marry you, mm -mm. marriage is tough, Mm -mm. the reason why is that I want to see God in my own marriage so I make sure that my heart is full people are saying that to succeed in Nigeria is difficult mm -mm. I'm not there because blessed are those that are pure in heart for they shall see God the problem why you are not blessed as you want to be blessed I have not seen the hand of God as you want to see the hand of God is that you are not yet pure in heart glory to God I said glory to God. I said glory to God. And when things are hard, I always tell myself, let's read first Samuel chapter 17 so we can close. I'm just laying the foundation of why your heart must be pure. Blessed are those that are pure in heart. Because I said, Father, bless me with marriage. Is your heart pure in marital area? Bless me, Father. Is your heart pure in that area? Or your heart has been. Let, let me. Do you have that bottle of water again? Give me a, a bottle of water. Maybe a new one. Is, is a clean one? Any, is, is that clean? Yeah, that's clean. Yeah, come, come. Yeah, thank you. You're my example guy for this day. Drink it. Drink some. Make sure it's clean. That's good. That is clean. That's good. That's good. Watch you. Just one strand of it. Yeah. Is this contaminated? Yeah. Is this contaminated? Yes, it is. It is. Ah, uh, but we cannot see it. You don't need a lot of poison to poison your heart. Just a little is okay. The reason why I'm saying so is that when you are wondering, am I contaminated? It's not about big thought or bad thought. It's the small thought that's entered inside you that's affecting your heart. So that thought, as, as this is, if it drinks it, it can have a running tummy. As it is right now, it can have typhoid. It's not, someone said, okay, if you think it doesn't matter, just drink small poison. <laughs> the reason why I'm saying so is that a lot of us, it's not even the big things. It's the small poison that's in our thought life about marriage that's holding us back. It's the small poison in our finance that's holding us back. It's the small poison in our, in our health that's holding us back. It's the small poison that's there. And the thing is this, you just say, eh, but it's just this small poison. But listen, blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see the Lord. The poison is holding you back. So every time I get into God's word, and this is why you must overcome the great thought. I need to overcome those thoughts so that the poison does not destroy me. Someone say hallelujah. Thank you. Let me give you another paradigm about David and Goliath. Ooh. Someone says that. Oh wow. David and Goliath. Can I submit to you? The real enemy that David had to overcome 
Oh, wow. Some things are very deep. Oh. <laughs> what was the first enemy that they had to overcome? What? The first enemy that they had to overcome was his brothers. His brothers underestimated him. When he finished with his brother, what's the second person? Saul. Saul says, you are too young to go into war. The, listen, the battle was not against Goliath. The battle was against his, his own brothers. The war you cannot win within, you cannot win without. So David must first conquer his environment. Are you hearing me? And let me tell you something. It's good to get advice. But be careful to get advice from those that feel in what you want to do. The reason why is that you can't win Goliath listening to Saul. Many of you want to win Goliath, but you are listening to Saul. If Saul could win Goliath, will he have called for you? Are you here? You are a single lady, you ask another single lady about someone that you are dating that wants to marry you. If she knew the secret of marriage, we should be married. You are broke. You need financial freedom. Your as owners are broke about what finances is. If they knew, wouldn't they have told you? I'm not looking down on them. I'm only saying that if you go to cancel from Saul about Goliath, you will never win Goliath. And that was why Saul, because Saul said, okay, use my battle. Jesus said, you don't understand. It's, if your bat, if your, if, he said, use my web armory. He said, if your armory, armory can work, why didn't you use them? He said, if I want to go to this, I need to go on my terms. Because your, my sling with God's blessing is bigger than your armor without blessing. Are you here? Are you here? Are you here? Let me begin to close so that we can close the service. So someone said, how do I deal with pain exactly? Someone is asking that, how do I deal with pain? Especially when it's, you know, it's from someone in my family, which I cannot cut away. And that reminds me, I have a personal story, very, very, very painful and traumatic story. It's my sister's story, but I was part of it. I remember that um, the way my family was structured during the long holiday, our extended families would come and spend time with us. They would come and spend time with us. And um, something terrible had happened, but I didn't know what it was. I used to stay in my mom's room, and that night particularly, my older sister was invited to come and stay in my mom's room to spend the night with me and my mom in the room. Around 1 a.m., I just hear, BASS! BOSS! I didn't know my mother had invited her to beat the living day out of her. My mother was beating her. The door was locked. Nobody could enter I was the only one, but I could also get up because I knew if I get up, I would receive beating. You know, bass, boss. My mother brought Pepe. I, I didn't understand. He said, Shebi, you like sex. You are going to now. He said, that thing that is making you like sex, I'll put Pepe inside. My mother was beating her. My sister was crying. Then I, the next morning, what happened was that one of the aunties that stayed had said that he saw my sister making out to one of my cousins. So, you know, and that report got to my mother. And my mother did not hear Jack Robinson again. And let me say this to you. All of you that have children, listen to your children. There's a generation that did not listen to their children and lost their children eventually. A lot of people that I deal with that were abused sexually as children, it was because their parents did not listen. There's a guy that told me, he said it was my house help that will call me and open her legs and say, put it there. He said, I was seven years old. He said, why didn't you tell my mother? He said, my mother will not believe me. You just see an extroverted child all of a sudden become introverted, does not talk again. And as a parent, you're not investigating. Fire has still burning and you don't know. Please listen to your children. They are, they are girls that were tampered with by their nieces, uncles, and all of those things. 
and they, in fact when they said it their mothers could not believe it and those children it's not just the rape that happened it's not just the sexual abuse that happened it's that they carried the pain that i actually opened up to my mother and my mother made me a liar so i became a liar because of this so i was not just abused i'm also a liar and they carried that thing i know what that does to them when they grow older they find it difficult to to open up to people and the reason why is that from the young age you silence their voice and the truth is that there are levels of healing you will experience you there are levels of healings you will not experience until you talk and that's why jesus christ said that confess your fault one to another it's not in terms of forgiveness of sin it's that speak so that healing can come to you there's a level of speaking that brings about healing some of you you are too quiet and that's why men die of hypertension the reason why is that they will say suck it in stock it up suck it in stock it up until you women sometimes you have to open your mouth and talk because until you talk nobody knows what you are going through and nobody knows the help they can offer to you back to my sister's story my sister is kind of person that my sister is not a that person that interacts with everybody that's not the kind of she's very picky and she told me she said that one of my cousins came that she just she didn't just find them intellectually compatible for her that it was this person he said, nothing sexual happened. Only that we spent a lot of time talking. He said, because the guy loves to read, and I love data, we communicated. He said, the other aunties that could not believe that, imagine that there was something happening, and they told my mom. The pain she bore was that, how come my mom would believe the aunties over her? So when you carry that kind of pain, that someone in your family hurts you, Maybe it was your dad. Maybe it was your brother that bullied you. Maybe it was your mom that did something that hurts you. And when people are celebrating them, even when you want to celebrate them, you feel that pullback because you can't get away with it. The first thing you must realize is this. This is the first thing. If they know better, they will have done better. Can I be, can I be more open with you? Most of you overestimate your parents' maturity when you are young. When you grow up, you will not realize that your parents, uncles, and nieces had their own challenges. Some of them had their own anger that they were taking out on you. They had their frustration of work and they were taking out on the children. That it was nothing about what you did. It was just that as life was happening to them, they were immature and took it out on somebody else. Someone in church was telling me why he didn't talk to the mother again. He said, because my mother got pregnant and left me. And it was in church here. And I said, excuse me, how old are you right now? He said, I'm 20, maybe 25. It's 22. I said, how old is your mother right now? She said, my mother is 40. I said, is it 40 or 41? I said, your mother had you at 18. He said, but she abandoned me. I said, you don't understand. You are 22 talking to me right now. If you have a child that is what you do, is that I'll run away. That's what your mother did. <laughs> and the reason why, this is the way you treat pain that comes from family. You will understand that if they knew better, because some of you, you were not the favorite of your parents. They didn't treat you as well. And you know, you know that they literally preferred your brother against you. You know, they preferred your sister against you. And there was a way it affected you. But the way things turned out, it turned differently. If they knew better, they would have done better. And the reason why they did what they did was, number one, they were going through their own season of life and did not know how to handle it. And sometimes that anger that depression they unleash within the family the second reason also is this and which oh my god somebody say hallelujah, hallelujah. somebody say hallelujah, hallelujah. Hmm. the second reason is this they had their own issues they were dealing with they didn't have to resolve it so they brought their issues into the family and if they are known better Done better. So why must you move on? This is why you must move on. You must always remember because someone says, my mother did this, my brother did this, it's so hard to forgive them. You must remember, if you refuse to forgive and move on, the damage you will do to yourself will be more than the damage they've done to you. The reason why is that you will carry that pain and pass it to your children because until pain is dealt with, it ends as a circle. 
it becomes a cycle. So you'll carry that pain and give it to your husband. You'll carry that pain and give it to your wife. And your wife will not understand why you are angry. And the reason why is that there'll be something you see in your husband that was in your father. You'll be reacting. It's not your husband you are acting against. It's something that you see in him that what reminds you of your past. You react against it. You'll be something you will see in your wife that will make you react. And it's not the wife. You're just reacting. And you must ask yourself, it doesn't stop there. When you have children, that cycle of pain also passes to them. You need to ask yourself, the pain must stop somewhere now. And that pain stops with you. And that's why you must decide that if I do not forgive and deal with this, the damage that was done to me is small. Compared to the damage, I will eventually deal to myself. Because people that bleed will ultimately bleed on people that did not cut them. Either knowingly or knowingly. Praise God. I didn't even read. We should pray. Dealing with what? Negative thoughts. The first thing David had to conquer was his brothers. Who are you? His brothers asked him, what's so special about you? And let me tell you something. I said it. Life is going to ask you what's so special about you. And you need to tell them it's not about me. It's about destiny. You didn't get it. Did you get it? When love asks you, what is it about you? You say, it's more than me. It's destiny. That this cause is a cause of destiny. Because they'll be like, are you the only one? Are you the only one? Are you the only one? Why are you choosing this path? And they'll say, things are so hard. Things are so hard. Things are so hard. And you tell them that the reason why things are hard, because comfort and change are, normal, are not children of the same mother. That means I can't be comfortable and have change at the same time. When I'm in transition, the pain I feel is not the pain that something is wrong. The pain I feel is because I'm in transition. And when I'm in transition, I need to push. When I'm in transition, I'm carrying pregnancy. And I'm trying to give birth to something. I feel pain. I feel pain because I'm moving from pregnancy to delivery. At that point, I don't look for abortion doctors. I look for midwives. If I find abortion doctors, I have an abortion. If I find midwives, I deliver my baby. Midwives are the people that will say, hey, let us push so that you can have the thing. Abortion doesn't say, let's give you tablets so I can destroy the process. Don't look for people to destroy the process. Look for people that will push you through. Job's wife was an abortion clinic. Cost God and die. Take shortcut and die. But Job said, no, I'll not cost God and die. Job was looking for midwives that would say, we know it's painful. Push. Nine months will soon be complete. This thing will come out. When you talk to people, who do you talk to? Abortion clinics or you talk to midwives? Because they are both in your lives. Abortion clinics and midwives. Which one do you talk to? When you are in transition and trying to give birth to something. Someone that will help you deliver, or someone that what? Will destroy it for you, and forget the vision. Father, give me midwives. Father, give me midwives. Let's go ahead and pray. Let's go ahead and stand on your feet, everyone, please. Father, give me midwives. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, give me midwives. Go ahead, I pray. In Jesus' name, we're praying. Lord, it will not always be rosy when we're in transition. But I'm praying for everyone here. When people are trying to break habits, when people are trying to make a change, that Lord, you will surround them with midwives, not abortion doctors, so that they will push until they can give it to destiny. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Were you blessed, Father? God bless you. Can have your seats. Glory to God.